It was a story that captured the world's attention. Trapped underground for 69 days, the ordeal is finally over. The last of the 33 Chilean miners is winched to the surface as a billion people watch the news coverage on TV. Yo me aferré a mi fe y dije vamos a salir y vamos vamos a lograr llegar a, a superficie en algún momento. The nail-biting rescue of the 33 captivated the world, and Chileans celebrated it as a national achievement. Viva Chile, viva! Viva! But it was perhaps the last moment of joy for all those in Chile's copper industry. Just months after the miraculous rescue, the copper market came plunging back down to earth. Mining companies cut costs as the copper price lost its luster. The high salaries that enriched a generation of miners are no longer affordable for an industry that has to dig deeper to reach the Earth's copper deposits. Work is doing one of the most dangerous jobs of fighting to retain the high salaries they once commanded. This year, they held the longest mining strike in nearly 50 years. Hemos visto morir compañeros de trabajo en esta faena. Entonces, nosotros sabemos el costo de estar acá. Copper runs through the veins of Chile. Cities have risen out of the desert, fueled by exports of the metal. As copper generated as much as a fifth of GDP, miners became some of the best paid workers in the country. Vivo generando plata, comprar mi casa, comprar mis vehículos. Mis hijos prácticamente no tuvieron la suerte de trabajar en la minería. Chile's copper boom has fizzled out. But copper fuels everything from the wiring in our cities to the batteries in our phones. As the country struggles to adjust to a new reality, can the good times ever return for Chile's copper industry? Chile is a country built on copper. During the boom years, the price of copper more than quadrupled mainly driven by insatiable demand from China. Copper carried Chile's economy to an average of 4% growth per year, fueling the rise of mining cities such as Antofagasta and Calama. In the first decade of this century, Chile's copper boom made the country one of the richest in Latin America. Miners rode copper's waves, sharing in the wealth from the boom. Ronaldo was born and raised in Calama, a city of about 140,000 people in northern Chile. He worked at the smelter in the Chuquicamata copper mine for 33 years before retiring this year. When I entered the empresa con a miedo, because when I entered the foundation, the ruido, the movement of the machinery was enormous. In cuanto al cambio que tuve cuando entré a Chuqui, fue harto grande. Fuimos generando plata. Y ahí comprando y dándome los gustos, darle la, la estabilidad económica para darle a mi familia. En esos años era, habían dos nomás, pues después fue creciendo. Y ahí hasta que llegó a tener, y el cambio que hubo radical fue grande mío porque empecé a tener mis cosas. Comprar mi casa, comprar mis vehículos, darle educación a mis hijos. Miners in Chile receive bonuses as high as 35,000 US dollars just for signing on to new contracts every few years. Ronaldo took early retirement when the state-owned miner Cadelco was cutting costs at Chuquicamata. His career has enabled him to buy four houses and two cars. He represents the generation of miners who have benefited most from copper's boom. For me, the minería is the sustain of the city of Calama. My children practically didn't have the chance to work in the minería. The biggest is the one who was closest to work in Chuqui. Andando en la parte minera, pero no tuvo la suerte de entrar a Codelco. Una, porque cuando estaba más joven le faltaba estudio. Y ahora que está, ahora que tienes profesional, no puede entrar tampoco porque no necesitan ingenieros. Entonces, ya para mí la minería fue la época mía nomás, pues para mis hijos lo veo más, más lejano. La... Ronaldo has followed in the footsteps of hundreds of thousands of Chilean men who have flocked to the Atacama Desert to make their fortunes. The driest desert in the world, with some places that have never recorded rain, it spans 41,000 square miles, roughly the size of Cuba. This moonscape is key to our future on Earth. Beneath the sand of the Atacama Desert lies 30% of the world's known supplies of copper and half of the world's lithium. 
In the 2000s, demand for copper soared as emerging economies, and especially China, grew exponentially. What happened is that 10 to 15 years ago, there was a major increase in the speed of uh, urbanization and uh, real estate investment in many uh, emerging economies, but basically in China. And, well, buildings are, and the cities are very intensive in copper because of the, the electrical grid. And that increased the demand for copper very substantially, and it really transformed the country. Companies were willing to pay large bonuses and ever higher salaries when the copper price justified, reducing an additional ton of copper at almost any cost. The, the boom years, people, what happens in companies is that they see this, these prices, very high prices. They feel that they're, they're not going to be there for, forever, and they, and they privilege speed, basically. So, you have a labor negotiation, let's get it over with. You know, let's just pay and get it over with. You want to expand your production, you just hire the first guy that comes, let's get it done. And that, that, that sort of approach makes sort of a short-term uh, sense in a way because you get it done, you get production and you sell, but it's a problem for the future, right? Something for the present, but it has enormous costs in the future. Companies' hunger to produce more and more copper also meant that rising wealth was coupled with poor safety standards. And on August the 5th, 2010, one of the country's worst ever mining accidents brought Chile to a halt. My name is Omar Rayegada Rojas, minero number 17, rescatado de la mina San Jose. La verdad es que yo soy nacido y criado en las minas. Eh, mi padre era minero virquinero, mi madre era campesina. Por lo tanto, yo desde pequeño me relacioné con el tema de la minería y yo desde un principio no quería ser minero por el hecho de ver cómo mi padre, mis tíos sufrían en la mina. Eh, cuando uno lo lleva en la sangre, algo. Omar worked at the now infamous San Jose Copper and Gold Mine, where he spent 12 years as a loader operator before it collapsed in August 2010. I worked with many derrumbes, I was a sector, and I kept taking it out because what was mineral, so I had to keep it there. You start to get used to the danger, and it becomes something normal of the turn. Warning signs of a potential collapse were ignored. When the mine succumbed, 33 miners were trapped 688 meters below ground for over two months. Omar recalls the moment the mine collapsed. In the moment of the derrumbe, I was carrying a car. When I felt a kind of expansive wave, where the fall of the rock produced like a kind of bomb. That gave me the sensation that the eyes would be opened, that the ears would be opened. I thought that it was an astronaut. And Y ahí ocurrió lo más grande, que se oscureció todo adentro porque se llenó de polvo y no se veía nada. Eh, dábamos gracias a Dios por lo que íbamos a comer y pedíamos por nuestra familia. Se empezaron a hacer diariamente a las 12 del día la oración, antes de almorzar. Almorzar, le decíamos nosotros, era comernos las dos cucharaditas de atún que se hacían primero cada 24 horas, después cada 48 horas y como ya Pasaba mucho día y quedaba poquito, lo empezamos a comer cada 72 horas. The rescue became a source of national pride, but as the elation from their rescue was wearing off, they had to adjust to normal life again. Nosotros salimos diferentes de la mina. Eh, me cuesta un poco. decir con estas palabras que. Hasta mi nieta más chica en una oportunidad me dijo que perdón que ella quería a su a su tata que, que era antes, no el de ahora. In 2011, less than a year after the miraculous rescue of the 33, Chile's copper industry hit another snag. After a decade of growth, the seemingly unassailable copper price began falling. 
It is now half the level of its peak in 2011. Chile's growth fell with it. Copper's drop prompted big mining companies in Chile, including state-owned Cadelco, BHP Billiton and Anglo-American, to cut costs. In the last few years, reduction in staff and attempts to cut benefits culminated in a six-week strike. Carlos Allendez is a miner and spokesman for the union that led the strike at the Escondida mine. Que hoy en día, pese a la reducción de costos de mano de obra, en áreas donde habían uno hasta tres trabajadores, hoy queda solamente uno. Nosotros llevamos años en esta compañía. La hemos visto crecer, hemos visto partir muchas generaciones de trabajadores, hemos visto morir compañeros de trabajo en esta faena. Entonces, nosotros sabemos el costo de estar acá. Nosotros queremos mucho esta empresa, pero también tenemos que tener reconocimiento. The union is aiming to protect all existing benefits for workers and to ensure that new employees receive equal compensation. No se le puede dar un sueldo diferente porque realizan la misma función. Esto provocaría entonces que la empresa podría cambiar por gente nueva con menos beneficios y todos los trabajadores antiguos que somos nosotros estaríamos expuestos entonces a que nos cancelaran, pero este trabajador nuevo nunca iba a obtener lo que nosotros ya teníamos. Entonces, esa era una discriminación total, era una división de clases sociales de trabajadores tipo A, tipo B. The strike ended in March when workers agreed to return to the mine on their old contract, foregoing any signing on bonus. BHP Billiton, the majority owner of the mine, says negotiations are expected to restart within the next 18 months. We see this as an opportunity to restart the, the engagement with the workforce. And, and hopefully try to reach a satisfactory agreement. If we compare Escondida, I don't know, two, two and a half years ago, uh, the total uh, headcount of Escondida is probably anywhere between 20 to 25 percent lower. Uh, that includes both employees and contractors. Uh, and we continue to move actually more material. So, so yes, so labor productivity has gone up but yet it's not at the levels that should be, to be very honest. There is a natural turnover. There will be people with different benefits. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess still the, the new benefits are very, very good, very highly competitive in any other ju jurisdiction and, and, and excellent compared to anything else that, that any other worker in Chile would get. Mining companies also have to contend with diminishing copper deposits. There is a natural decline of every, every copper deposit. So pits get deeper, holes get longer, and grades get lower. And, uh, and what that causes essentially is that the cost structure suffers and, and you need to do things to offset that. The desert is not yielding copper as easily. Mining companies have to go deeper and extract more rock to find the same amount of copper. After a century of mining copper, the Chukikamata mine, the world's largest open pit copper mine, which once gave the Rockefeller family their fortune. Cadelco is spending $4 billion to burrow to a depth of 900 meters, more than twice the height of the Empire State Building. That's in the hope of prolonging the life of the mine to 2060. It's really hard to imagine that this massive open pit copper mine is coming to the end of its life. There's about 1,500 workers here who drive trucks to the bottom of the mine, but only about 30% of them will be trained for the new deep underground section, and the rest might lose their jobs. Miners in the US also have to dig to similar depths, but workers there are more productive than in Chile. This is despite the fact that they get paid roughly the same salary. While copper prices and miners' salaries have risen, productivity among Chilean copper miners has declined dramatically. So Chile's copper industry is facing shrinking copper deposits, higher costs and lagging productivity, all while China's demand has slowed and copper prices have tailed off. Companies are trying to adjust to this new reality by cutting costs, but they face a rising tide of workers' discontent. If you look at the underlying trends in international demand for copper, there are some promising signs and I think one of the most promising ones actually is really the appearance of the electrical economy. Electrical vehicles use much more copper than the oil and petrol uh, vehicles we use today. Also electrical vehicles require a substantial electrical grid which, uh, where, where copper is very useful. Copper is a vital ingredient for a post-oil future but Chile can no longer rely on the perpetual growth of its copper industry. 
I think that the, the super boom years were an exceptional thing and who could expect something that happened just once in history to happen again, right? Mining is going to be a, an important thing in our economy. Chile is a mining country. The copper market's recovery isn't the only challenge for Chile. The problem is that in the next boom, if it happens, we're going to have to find a way to discipline ourselves. We're going to have to use some of it for the inequality and poverty, but another part, we're going to have to use it to finance an expansion of new sectors. Chile's copper industry is at a crossroads. Even if our consumption patterns mean global demand for copper will increase in the coming decades, the Chilean government and mining companies are under increasing pressure. How they handle labour disputes will be a key part of ensuring a sustainable future for Chile's copper industry. A nadie le gusta las huelgas largas ni prolongadas porque aquí todos perdemos. Si la empresa quiere llegar a proyectarse 80 años más, tiene que hacerlo con nosotros. Que la minería es un es una una labor de de peligro. Falta voluntad del empresario para que invierta en lo que asegura. Invierten cuando le hacen una una inspección y después se olvida. The challenges for the copper industry will not be easy to overcome, but copper mining has moved the country for the last few hundred years and is likely to play a large part in keeping it moving for the next hundred.